We praise you for the wonderful communion of the Trinity, for the relationship of love between Father, Son, and Spirit. And we thank you for your grace and mercy to us that we might uh, join with you in glory and in wonder and rejoice in your fellowship. We pray that your blessing would be on us, that you would strengthen us by grace. Show us Jesus our Lord as our great mediator, who alone has accomplished our salvation, and to whom be the glory forever and ever. We pray for your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's remain standing and we'll confess our faith in making use of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Chapter 5. 1 John 
chapter 5, that's towards the back of your Bible. You use the Pew Bible, it's on page 1304. 1 John 5, verses 1 through 6. John writes to the churches in Ephesus in that region. And he says the following. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. We'll finish our reading at this time from God's Word here. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer and bring our request to Him together in prayer. Let's our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in providing for our homes and our families and our church over recent months and years. We thank you that you have been uh, a good and gracious God to us. We thank you most especially that you brought us redemption from our sins, deliverance from evil. You've given to us the, the wonder of your peace that we might be, uh, have settled hearts, hearts that are at rest in your provision of grace. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We pray, Lord, that your blessing would be on us, that as we gather before you this day, on the Lord's day, that you would be with us, and strengthen us by your word and spirit. Bless the fellowship that we share around the communion meal. We pray, Lord, that you would build us up in our faith, and strengthen us to walk with you. Father, I pray that you would be with us, those who are in need at this time, we pray for those who are not feeling well this morning. We pray to be with Jack Kimmel and uh, restore his health, uh, strengthen him. We thank you for him, his wife, and for their celebration of 40 years of marriage. And we thank you that we could share with them in that last week. We pray, Lord, for your continued blessing and provision for them and their needs. We thank you for John Baldwin and pray that you would uh, give him relief from his sufferings. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would bring healing to him and help him to recover from this concussion. Uh, we pray, Lord, for your blessing on Esther as she cares for him. Help her to have patience and strength and love and mercy. And we pray, Lord, for your blessing on them. Be with the rest of the Baldwin family. We pray that you would watch over Tim, Rosemary, and Rebecca. Provide for them and their needs. Uh, we thank you especially of Rebecca and her child Zachary and pray that you would sustain them, provide for them and for the whole family. We pray for your blessing on them. Father, we thank you for your care for uh, Ryan. We thank you for him and his fellowship uh, from week to week and we pray that your spirit would bless him with joy, with peace, uh, with resting in you and your provision for him. Pray that you would open opportunities for him if it be your will uh, to serve in different capacities and we pray that you would provide for we thank you, Lord, for watching over Joe Yates and for uh, sustaining him in recent uh, weeks with uh, various aches and pains and illness. We pray, Lord, that you would watch over his health and strength. We pray that as he uh, deals with some, some health issues, uh, that your hand of healing and blessing will be on him and on Nancy as well. We thank you for them, for the fellowship in your church, and pray that you would strengthen and provide for them. Father, we pray for uh, Rhoda. We thank you that she is able to uh, join with us as a member of First Church. We pray that your blessing would be on our uh, uh, reception of her next week. Uh, we thank you for your work of grace in her life and for uh, the joy of her fellowship here. And we pray that we would be a 
mutual encouragement and blessing to each other over the years. Uh, we thank you for Emmanuel and pray for your blessing on him. Uh, watch over his uh, eyes and we pray for uh, continued healing there. And we pray, Lord, that you would minister to him in every way according to your grace and love. We thank you for watching over uh, uh, George and Ella McLaren and Bob and uh, Carol Minnick uh, as they uh, deal with the advance of age. And uh, We pray, Lord, that you would uh, protect them from falls. We pray that you would give them safety and stability in their homes. We thank you for the good measure of health that they've enjoyed. And pray, Lord, for your hand of blessing on them, that uh, they would know that they are loved and appreciated by uh, your church and loved by you most of all. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on them and that you would sustain them. Be with uh, Heidi. We thank you for this uh, very busy time of year for her and thank you for the way that you have sustained her through it all. Thank you for the blessing of music and for these young people who are learning to sing, even to sing your praises and pray, Lord, that your blessing would be on that, that this would be a witness to them and to all who hear that your name would be glorified and exalted. And we thank you, Lord, for Plumstead Christian School, both the elementary and high school, and pray for your blessing and provision for them. Thank you, Lord, for each one who is here today. We pray for your blessing on us all. We pray, Lord, that you provide for our earthly needs and help us to rest in you for all good things. We thank you, Lord, for your provision for the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. We pray for the men of our presbytery, that you, you would bless the ministry of your word this day. We thank you for the many gifts that you've given to your church, and pray that you would prosper your church in the gospel of Christ. We pray for your blessing on our country. We thank you for our president, for his administration, and pray that you would guide them in the paths of righteousness, in truth, and love. We pray, Lord, that you would keep them from harm and from evil. We pray, Lord, for our uh, Congress and for our judicial system as well, that you would lead them also in the paths of uprightness, of integrity, of righteousness, of truth. We pray that you preserve these men and their families from harm, uh, women as well. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless and provide for each one as they serve in their different capacities. We pray for our military overseas and here at home that you would watch over them. We thank you for these young people who go off to fly planes and pilot ships and uh, run into battle scenes. We pray, Lord, that your hand of protection and care would be on each of them. We pray, Lord, that you would provide them with uh, safety and for all their provisions. We uh, commit them to your love and care. We pray for our chaplains who minister the gospel to them. May they do so with freedom with courage, with boldness, and with your blessing. And we pray that those who would try to silence uh, Christian chaplains would themselves be silenced. And we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen your witness throughout our military branches. We thank you for uh, them and pray for your blessing on each one. We thank you for the way that you've watched over us and provided for our needs. We commit ourselves to you and to your care and ask that you would teach us to pray even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of forever. Amen.
We are called the spiritual warfare, and this hymn is a hymn which reflects on that, and I hope that we can sing this to the glory of God, to our mutual encouragement. Hymn number 483, and let's stand to sing.
then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that we might gather before you this morning to hear what your spirit is saying to the churches. We pray, Lord, that your word would be applied to our hearts, that we would receive it in faith, and respond with grateful lives that are obedient to you and a glory to your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We had a rather ominous message last week from Romans chapter 7 where the Apostle Paul says that there is this uh, remain of our old Adamic nature still yet within us. We still have this propensity to evil that continues to abide within our hearts. Paul describes that in, in the word flesh, not so much describing our physical nature, but describing that sinful principle that continues to be at work within us. Paul does note that there has been a decided break in our lives with a view to our union with Christ and in his death and resurrection. There's been a transformation of us so that now, whereas once that sinful attitude, that uh, fleshly habit reigned supreme without any contradiction, now when we come to faith in Christ, there's a new principle of life at work, and now suddenly there's this great conflict at work within our hearts between that which the flesh wants and that which the spirit wants. Again, not physical body, inward mind and heart so much, as sinful nature as opposed to uh, a renewed nature, a nature that is newborn by the Spirit and living in accord with the Spirit. There's this great ongoing conflict then within us, and Paul speaks in rather dour terms when he speaks of the, the, the violence of our old sinful nature, how now, it enslaves us, it captures us, drags us off, and we end up doing things that we don't want to do, things that uh, we don't agree uh, with, but nonetheless, that sinful nature works itself out in our lives. And so, for the believer, we have to recognize, first of all, that there is this experience of sin within us. 
We have not arisen to a point of perfection where we are free from all sin, but rather we continually have to deal with this sinful nature. One of the things that, in reflect on that, we should consider is, do I have this inner conflict within my heart? Do I see this movement of sin and evil within me that sometimes just drags me off into the same kind of sinful habit behavior over and over and over again, and I agree with God's love that this is wrong, I recognize the truth of God's word, I really want to live for Christ and for His glory, but there we go again. So there's this sinful nature that yet remains, but there ought to be as well a renewed nature that now has joined the fight. A renewed nature that loathes what takes place. Paul says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And that's the response of the Christian, of that renewed soul, looking at that sinful nature and saying, I am a wretch. In view of the propensities and the actions of this old sinful nature that yet remains within me. All is not lost. Paul rejoices in God's goodness and says, Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now that's just a, a very capsule statement, condensed statement of all the glory that comes to us through Jesus Christ and His great work of transformation that has begun when we first believe in Him. Today I want to take the next step along in, in this and, and develop how Paul sees how we should battle with this old sinful nature. How it is that our lives can actually be renewed. And how we can actually do those things which are pleasing to God in Christ. Rather than constantly falling into sinful habits and patterns and so forth. There needs to be an inward renewal. There needs to be an inward change that God works by His Spirit. And the Apostle Paul addresses that in the third chapter, the second chapter of Colossians, the book of Colossians. Uh, Paul talks about those who saw the uh, evil within human nature, and the remedy for it was through a wide variety of uh, ascetic type practices, all kinds of rituals and obligations, and as Paul described it, severe treatments of the body on the one hand, and then giving oneself over to dreams and speculations and uh, ideas about angels and, and all these kinds of things. And Paul says, you have pursued earthly things and tried to deal with an earthly, with a fleshly spiritual problem. And these outward efforts of yours really don't address the core issue, which is the sinful nature that is within your heart. And so all those practices, observance of various holidays, religious holidays, um, Fastings and prayers and uh, pilgrimages and all these kinds of things that, that people even continue to do today. All these things, Paul effectively says, is, are, are of no benefit to you because they miss the point. They fight the fleshly nature with fleshly actions. And so they fail to achieve what people hope to achieve in renewing their lives. Paul points us in a different direction. He points us in the direction of Jesus Christ. And really the, the, the way to overcome the sinful nature is by looking to Him. And we need to think on that for a little bit, what all that means and all the implications for that here. And Paul begins in this third chapter by speaking about in the first, I think, three verses or so, uh, seeking the things which are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on these things, or think on them. So you have Paul exhorting the church to engage in kind of, if you will, two efforts. Seeking the things above and thinking on them. Different ways of describing the same kind of activity. Faith looking up to the heavens, <clears throat> looking up to Jesus Christ and His accomplished work. And seeking the benefits of that which he has accomplished for us in heaven. You know, we are in our church calendar on the sixth Sunday after Easter. We 
don't always observe the church calendar, but it's helpful for us because one thing that it reminds us of is that first, the work of Christ goes beyond his cross. Sometimes in evangelical circles, uh, the focus is so much on the cross of Christ. Christ died for you and paid the penalty for your sins. You can be forgiven here. All true. But we finish our message of the gospel there and forget to, to point out that Jesus has risen from the dead. And without the resurrection, the cross is meaningless because he didn't accomplish what was necessary. The resurrection certifies that his offering of himself was accepted by God. And as Paul describes in 1 Timothy 3, Jesus was declared, or vindicated, declared just. In other words, Jesus was proclaimed righteous and risen from the dead. And now we can rejoice that our salvation is accomplished. But there's more. On Thursday of this week, if you follow again the Christian calendar, we celebrate Ascension Day. Now, no obligation to observe that. But we are reminded that after 40 days of being on the earth and appearing before his disciples, Christ's work was not finished. But he ascended up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And really what we need to remember is that this is where Jesus is now. He's in the heavens. He's not on that cross of long ago. It's not like if you enter into a Roman Catholic church and you see the cross there and a body depicted there where you go and take, sit at the altar and they have the body of Christ, the real physical body of Christ broken for you and the blood shed for you, re-sacrificing the, the body of Christ. No, His body ascended. It's in heaven. And Paul exhorts us to consider, think about, reflect upon, and seek after Christ in glory. Be transformed by that. Uh, in the providence of God, uh, yesterday at Presbytery, uh, as we met in Glenside, uh, um, Lane Tipton, uh, seminary professor and pastor of our church in Easton, talked a bit about the resurrection of Christ and his ascension into heaven and the glory of Christ there and how um, it, in fulfillment of, of the Psalms where, uh, as Peter quotes the Psalm, I think Psalm 110, uh, Christ ascends into glory and enjoys pleasures with God forevermore. And by our union with Christ in his resurrection and ascension, it's our privilege to receive those joys and to rejoice in Christ our King in heaven above. We would do well to meditate on the glory of Christ and His heavenly session, His ascension at the right hand of God. One of the things that you would consider there is that we are united to Christ there in heaven. This theme of union with Christ is vital to our understanding of our justification as to how we've been saved, but also for our sanctification. We read last week in terms of sanctification from John chapter 5, where Christ says, He is the vine and we are the branches. Except you abide in me, you cannot bear fruit. There's a union with Christ that uh, produces fruitfulness within our lives. And so our, our union with Christ is foundational to our understanding of our justification. He died for me. He was my representative at the cross. He bore the wrath of God in my place. And so I am united to him in his death and in his resurrection. But I also have a vital connection to him as my living Lord. And by his spirit, he produces life within me enabling me now to live for the glory of God. And so as Jesus lives in the heavens and obeys the will of God in glory with perfection, we are strengthened and enabled here by the Spirit of Christ to live a renewed life. 
And so we need to think about these things. Thinking is important in the Christian faith. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12 urges us to present our bodies as living sacrifices to the Lord uh, and have our minds renewed. These things go hand in hand. I'll say this with regard to the flesh and the body and the presenting our bodies to the Lord. You, you, you get a little bit of a flavor of that as well in Colossians 3, verses 4 and following, where it talks about uh, the members of your body or the present your members no longer to sin. Um, while our fleshly nature is a spiritual thing and rooted within our hearts, and out of our heart, this evil ascends, it does work itself out through our physical bodies, does it not? I mean, we are the ones who speak evil. We are the ones that do evil. We are the ones that think evil. And so there are synapses firing in our brains where we are thinking evil things. And you go further, here's a little bit of counseling. The body becomes habituated to sin. The body is not the source of sin in and of itself. It's created by God and good and to be received. But it becomes habituated to sin because of our sinful nature. And so, to put it in, in rather obvious terms, if a man is a drunkard, then his body becomes habituated to that drink. And he has a craving for a drink. Like I have a craving for coffee from time to time. The body gets habituated to these kinds of things. If you are a cigarette smoker, and you become aware of the fact that God wants you to uh, preserve your body, and preserve your health, and the, the cigarette is something that harms your physical health. It may be that uh, you have a real habit with this uh, cigarette, a nicotine habit, but also a physical habit. You are used to, accustomed to having a cup of coffee in one hand and a cigarette in another uh, on your, your break at work. And you're sitting outside now, and you're smoking with one hand, and, and you're used to bringing your hand to your mouth with a cigarette in it. But if you give up the cigarette, now you're wondering, what do I do with my hand? And you want to have something in your mouth. That's why it's helpful for some folks to chew on something, chew, chew some gum or something, just to have something going on there. But the body becomes habituated to sin. And so when Paul says, present your bodies in Romans 12 as a living sacrifice to the Lord, it means that there needs to be some changes in our physical activities. And if you begin, begin to control the body and what it does, and that begins to work itself into the heart and its desires, its passions, the way to crucify the old nature is to put off these old habits, to bring them to an end. So that brings us to Paul's description of how to deal with this sinful nature that remains within us. There are two descriptions that he has for this nature. Uh, in terms of the actions that we uh, bring against our sinful nature. On the one hand, he says we are to put it to death, crucify it, mortify it is the old Puritan word. Put those sinful habits and patterns to death. Now that reminds us that this is warfare, is it not? This is very serious business. This needs to be stopped. And a certain measure of violence is necessary. Jesus, remember, is talking about uh, the sin of adultery. says that it's better for you to enter into heaven without your eye. Pluck your eye out rather than to go into to hell, be cast into hell with your two eyes. Or to cut off your hand if that's what causes the offense. Now, he wasn't talking literally so much. But the, the habits that dominate the eyes and the hands or the feet or what have you, that has to be changed. And so we need to put these things to death. Stop them. Kill them. Or they'll kill you. I mean, later on, Paul's going to say that it's because of these things that the wrath of God is coming. And so that kind of echoes what Jesus had to say in the Sermon on the Mount about the very serious nature of this conflict that we are engaged in. The wrath of God is coming. That ought to be plenty of motivation to put off our sinful nature, to do battle with it. But put it to death. The second, the second uh, 
image that Paul uses to describe the spiritual warfare is that of putting off the old man, putting off our sinful nature, and then he'll talk in a moment about putting on the new man. And it's the language of put, taking off a set of clothing and putting on a new set of clothing. Remember Joshua, the high priest in the uh, Old Testament book of Zechariah, if I remember correctly. Uh, Joshua uh, appears in the temple before God in a vision and he's dressed with filthy garments and there is Satan beside him accusing him saying, how filthy you are, you should not be here. But what does God do? He takes off those filthy garments and clothes him with pure white garments. And it's a picture of our justification. Our old nature, our sin is taken off and taken away, destroyed. But in Christ, we receive a righteousness that is perfect and complete. So often, especially in the book of Revelation, you see a picture of the saints dressed in pure white linen garments, depicting a, their priestly nature, but also their innocence, their perfection. Through our justification, this has taken place. Now what Paul says is that just as you have died with Christ and have been risen with Him, now work that out in your life by actually putting to death the old nature and living for God. Put off, put on. Take off your old habits and patterns and put on new habits and patterns of life. I'm reminded that this is not something that's too strange or foreign to us. Um, I'm standing before you with a clerical robe, which has a certain set of information for you that um, somebody is a minister of the word, ordained and properly authorized to preach the scriptures. It's not necessarily the case, but they say that clothes make the man. You go out into the street, you find a police officer dressed in a police uniform. You recognize immediately he is somebody with a certain measure of responsibility attributed to him. And so the clothes make the man. You go to the sports stadium and you see the Eagles dressed in their uniforms and the, the Patriots in their uniforms. They're, they are authorized to be on that field and to play the game of football. You just can't run on the field yourself and join them. Clothes make the man. If you were even to go to the movies and watch one of the Marvel comic movies, you see Superman. What does he do? Well, the man Clark Kent. He's going to save Lois Lane. He's got to step into a phone booth or something, change his clothes, and out he comes into his cape and, and goes off as the cape crusader. A Batman. Bruce Wayne, rich man that goes out in high society, but when uh, crime calls and the Batman signals up the sky, he goes into the, the Batcave, gets on his uniform, and off he goes to the Batmobile. Clothes make the man. Right? Being a little silly here, but you get the idea. We are to put on Christ and to live in Christ rather than our old sinful nature. And so we look to Christ who is above and we see the blessed revelation of His compassion, kindness, goodness, patience, forgiveness, all the qualities that Paul will talk about here that we ought to be putting on ourselves. They are united in Jesus Christ and there are ours in Him. Now let me say this. There are some who preach morals and good works and and the importance of changing your life, self-improvement, and trying to change yourself in different ways. It's all well and good to get over a habit of drunkenness, to get off the drugs, to uh, find work that provides for yourself or what have you. All these things are good, but they're just outward and empty things if they're not truly qualified by union with Christ. True morals are found in union with Christ. Because there they are in their perfection. In service to God, in obedience to God, and by the power of the Spirit. You see, there's more to a good life than merely the outward conduct. Good morals are more than just 
being friendly and kind and helpful. They need to be the result of our union with Christ and a revelation of Christ and His person and His work. And so the moral life is a life which is transformed by union with Christ. And each of those moral qualities that we talk about, compassion, mercy, kindness, goodness, all these many things, are qualified by being found in Christ. And if you wish to understand them truly, you have to see them in Christ. If you try to understand them apart from Christ, apart from His resurrection and ascended life, just merely in terms of what I can do on my own if I think it through and work through a pattern and try to reform my life, you've accomplished nothing. An outwardly moral life will still get you to hell. Right? There are many Pharisees who are very particular about their good works. Very particular. More particular than most people today. But many of them are going to hell. Jesus called them a brood of vipers and proclaimed God's woes to them. Their outward conduct really didn't satisfy God. True life is lived in union with Jesus Christ. And as we know Him, as we have fellowship with Him, as we come to Him and pray that He would grant us grace to be passionate, gracious, kind, good, loving, forgiving, restraining our evil impulses. As we come to Jesus and pray and seek, as Jesus said, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be opened unto you. We have these things through our union with Christ. And so therefore we must be reflecting, letting, letting our minds dwell on Christ. How do I understand compassion in Christ? As it's portrayed in the gospel accounts. As Paul interprets that, as he looks back on the life of Christ and he, he preaches how we should live before God. These things are in union with Christ. Death, resurrection, they both are at work in the Christian life. Death to the old nature, resurrection to live to God and for His glory and praise. So when you look at what Paul has to say here, and let me begin to wrap this up, there, there's so much more to be said about this chat, this section here, but as you look at what Paul says here, you bring this to a conclusion as it gets towards the end of the text, he begins to unpack this idea of thinking on Christ. As, as he says in Ephesians chapter 4, um, he, he says, you've not come, he, he talks about learning Christ, and the word he uses there is the basis of mathematics uh, in the Greek, but it, it's learning Christ. We need to learn Christ. And uh, towards the end here, he talks about uh, letting the word of Christ dwell within you richly. you got to meditate. you got to think upon the text of Scripture and work it into your heart into your mind, into your life, so that you are consciously praying about it and trying to work it out in, in your daily living. So when you read the Bible, just don't pass over the surface of things. Take a moment to think about it. What does this text say in the light of the surrounding verses, and the rest of the whole, in the light of all of Scripture? What does it say to me in my circumstances? Develop that. Meditate on it. And think about specific ways in which I need to change in view of what Christ says. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Uh, he talks about singing. Here's a great way in which the word of Christ begins to dwell within you. If you're able to sing God's word, that brings into the emotions. Attaching emotions to the word of God uh, gives added strength to that great work of so this is what God calls us to. We have this old fleshly nature that yet remains within us, but it will not have dominion over you. Its power has been broken such that you are now enabled in Christ to begin to live a new life, to begin to make that moral transformation, 
that grows more and more from day to day, month to month, year to year, over the course of a lifetime. And we, as those of us who are older can testify, we don't come to arrive at the place of perfection in this life. There's always a battle. There are new battles as you get older. The battles change of a different nature. But they're always there. There's always something that we have to battle with. Constantly being tested. Constantly being called upon to abandon our own personal resources and look above to Jesus Christ for help to deal with the many challenges of life. Every step along the way from childhood on to our final moments, we must look to Christ for help. Lord God, we do come to you through Jesus Christ and pray that as you have blessed us with union with Christ, as he is our life and we are hid in him, we pray that you would grant us grace to put off the old nature with all of its many evils and to put on the new nature, the new man that Christ has provided us. Put on Christ, his righteousness, his goodness and love that we might be a delight to you and that we might delight in you ourselves, rejoicing in you and your goodness, finding your peace dwelling within our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that as you uh, so work within us, uh, grant that we will be a glory to your name, doing all things in the name of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's respond to God's word by giving ourselves and our offerings at this time.
Heavenly Father, we do confess to you together that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We confess that in many different ways we've fallen short of your perfection. We pray, Lord, that you would wash us and cleanse us from all our sins, from idolatry to um, um, murders and, and, and lusts and passions and evil desires. We pray, Lord, that all these many things would be uh, granted forgiveness through Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would grant us grace to repent of them, to turn to you and to trust in you and to walk with you. We pray for your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord promises to forgive us in these words from Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Let's pray. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated unto you. And then use us, we pray you, as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your people. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Lord Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper as an ordinance to be observed by his church until he comes again. It is not a re-sacrificing of Christ, but a remembrance of the once-for-all sacrifice of himself in his death for our sins. Nor is it a mere memorial to Christ's sacrifice. It is a means of grace by which God feeds us with the crucified, resurrected, exalted Christ. He does so by his Holy Spirit and through faith. Thus he strengthens us in our warfare against sin and in our endeavors to serve him in holiness. The sacrament further signifies and seals the forgiveness of our sin and our nourishment and growth in Christ. The bread and wine represent the crucified body and the shed blood of the Savior which he gave for his people. In this sacrament, God confirms that he is faithful and true to fulfill the promises of his covenant, and he calls us to deeper gratitude for our salvation and to renewed consecration and the more faithful obedience. The Supper is also a bond and pledge of the communion that believers have with him and with each other as members of his body. As scripture says, for we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. The Supper anticipates the consummation of the ages when Christ returns to gather all his redeemed people at the glorious wedding feast of the Lamb. As we come to the Lord's table, we humbly resolve to deny ourselves, to crucify the sin that is within us, to resist the devil, and to follow Christ as becomes those who bear his name. Let's pray. We pray, Lord, that as we take part in this communion meal, that your blessing will be upon us. We pray for the forgiveness of our sins, and we pray that you grant us faith to receive these elements and to participate in the glories and the joys and the blessings that are ours in Christ. We thank you that in this communion, where we are reminded in a most solemn way of our union with Christ, we pray, Lord, that you would enrich our faith, strengthen our hope, and secure us in Christ. In whose name we pray. Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, as I, ministering in his name, give this bread to you.
said, Take, eat, this is my body which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. Savior also took the cup, and having given thanks, as such has been done in his name, he gave it to his disciples as I, ministering in his name, give this cup to you. Father, we thank you for this communion meal whereby we are united to Christ and fed by your Spirit on Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen our faith, hope, and love. Help us to live to your glory and praise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This time I'd like to take an offering for those who are needy.
and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you.